I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class, and probably also my administrative law uh, course when this case is added to the casebook about the case SALA Law LLC versus the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. This is a pretty new US Supreme Court case from the year 2020 about presidential removal powers. So let's look at what happens in this case. So the story starts with the global financial crisis that began in 20, uh, 2008. And in 2010, Congress passed a, a, a really um, expansive uh, law to help recover the economy. And that included creating the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or CFPB, which was supposed to be an independent regulatory agency to ensure that um, uh, consumer debt products or uh, th things you can borrow, lenders, would be safe, that is not uh, pose a crazy risk uh, for consumers, and transparent or understandable. And the CFPB uh, received enforcement authority over 18 existing uh, consumer protection statutes plus uh, one new law, so that was 19 total. And Congress gave the CFPB pretty extensive powers for rulemaking, enforcement, and adjudications. It could conduct investigations, issue subpoenas, conduct administrative adjudications, prosecute civil actions in federal court, and issue binding decisions in administrative proceedings. Now, historically, most independent agencies have been directed at, um, or have been directed by multi-member boards or commissions. But the CFPB was led by a single director appointed by the president with Senate confirmation who served a five-year term. This was something that had been kicked around back and forth uh, in, during uh, the legislative history, the uh, um, debates leading up to this. And they finally settled on having a single director. And the CFPB got busy in its first decade by the time this case came out, um, they had obtained uh, uh, over $11 billion in relief for tens of millions of consumers. So this wasn't a dormant agency by any means. Uh, they had gone through a series of directors by the time this case came out though. Um, the statute provided that the president could remove the director only for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. In other words, what we call in the legal circles for cause removal. And this is why we're studying this case, is that um, we have a sole director that the president can only remove for cause. And <clears throat> there are very rare, few examples of this historically. They're incredibly rare. Um, and it's hard to find an example of a single director who can't, the president can't just fire, who really has this much power. In addition, the CFPB received its funding outside the appropriations process of the Federal Reserve, which itself is funded outside Congress's annual budget appropriations process. Um, the Federal Reserve gets funded by bank assessments. And so this meant that um, one of the traditional controls that the legislature or Congress has over agencies, which is the power of the purse strings, um, it did not necessarily have over the CFPB um, because uh, they're not part of the annual budget. And so there's an additional level of sort of isolation or independence or autonomy for this agency. Now, in 2017, the CFPB launched an investigation into SALA Law LLC, which was a small law firm that was offering various debt-related legal services to clients. And um, the, the, this wasn't even at the stage of an enforcement action. SALA law refused to comply with the subpoena. The, they were being asked to submit information and they brought a court challenge um, basically saying this agency shouldn't even exist. We shouldn't have to comply with the subpoena because the agency itself is legally invalid. Um, the district court and the Ninth Circuit actually ruled in favor of the agency and against SALA law. And then we go to the Supreme Court. Now, keep in mind that by the time the Supreme Court is hearing the case, the Trump administration was in office, and there were two things going on. First, they weren't really um, defending the statute in this case, and, and in fact, Trump had appointed a director 
of the C, uh, um, uh, CFPB, who was in the process of basically kind of shuttering or um, the agency was really scaling back its enforcement, had changed the name, had uh, fired a lot of the staff or allowed um, the uh, not hired enough people to staff it and so forth. So that they were sort of shutting down the agency uh, in any case under the Trump administration. So the Supreme Court thought that this was an important issue, uh, a case though for presidential removal powers. And so they appointed an attorney named Paul Clement who argues cases regularly before the court. He's very, a very famous uh, Washington DC lawyer to serve as the friend of the court or amicus and defend the statute and the CFPB. Um, and I'm only explaining this so that students can understand when they read the opinion, the majority opinion keeps referring to amicus um, instead of to the, the, uh, the government or the lawyers because the government wasn't arguing in favor of the CFPB. They had, uh, basically uh, were rolling over on the case. And so the court had applied, had basically appointed someone who they know is very competent to um, argue that side, even though he was um, destined to lose. So the court held uh, ultimately that the CFPB's leadership by a single individual who was removable only for inefficiency, neglect, or malfeasance violates the separation of powers and is therefore unconstitutional. In other words, it puts too much executive and legislative power in the hands of one person who's not as accountable as the heads of all the other executive branch agencies. So most agencies, um, the, the director can be just fired at will by the president. That's part of one of the president's main um, powers, uh, according to the court, is to appoint agency heads and remove agency heads who aren't carrying out his policies. So, and so the uh, plurality of the court, uh, there was a fractured opinion on parts of the opinion, also held that this part of the statute about having a single director um, who was not removable by the president except for cause was severable. So, and that meant that the agency itself would survive and the rest of the statute survives. Um, and just by way of explaining this, the constitution vests uh, all executive power in the president. And so the court has, at least for the last hundred years or so, held that the president has sole authority to remove executive branch appointees. Even so, um, and no, no, we're not just talking about executive branch employees, but people that are appointed by the president, then the president has the ability to remove. Even though their appointment has to be confirmed by the Senate, removal does not. So at the same time, the court has for a long time held that Congress can create expert agencies, basically independent agencies who are led by a group of principal officers. And so we usually call these boards or commissions um, who are removable by the president only for good cause. And there's a lot of discussion in this opinion about two cases in particular that we study in both in statutory interpretation and regulation and in administrative law. And one is Humphrey's executor. So just to recap or review very quickly, the court in Humphrey's executor had allowed Congress to provide for cause removal or to require that there's a good cause to remove someone uh, for the uh, chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And now the Federal Trade Commission is a bipartisan commission. In other words, when the president appoints um, uh, people to fill vacancies, um, it, it has to, it's an odd number, but it has to be basically an almost even mix of Democrats and Republicans, people from each party. And now this opinion calls them experts and they are traditionally, uh, the people on the Federal Trade Commission are qualified, but that's not necessarily in the statute, right? The president could pick a political friend if he wanted. Um, and if he could get the person through Senate confirmation. Also on the FTC, remember that the members of the commission are appointed for staggered terms. So no president gets to come in and just appoint the whole commission. Um, he has to wait for a vacancy, to, a new vacancy to open up each year. So he's gonna get to replace one person on the commission in theory each year uh, of his presidency. And then the next president will have a holdover commission and we'll have to get uh, um, replace them 
one at a time, one year, year by year. Now, the Federal Trade Commission performed quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial functions, but the court here says that they did not exercise purely executive power. Um, I, I do want to say this is a debatable way of reading Humphrey's executor, and the dissent strongly agrees with this interpretation, but that is how the court, um, in this case, the majority opinion, is reading Humphrey's executor, is that the head of the FTC wasn't really exercising executive power. He was um, creating rules and adjudicating claims. And then the majority says that the CFPB PB is very different from the FTC, which was the focus of Humphrey's executor. The sing single director structure and the five-year term guarantee abrupt, abrupt shifts in agency leadership and with it, the loss of accumulated expertise. In other words, when you have a commission with staggered terms, even if you replace one of them, the remainder of the commission have been working together for a while. They know what they're doing. Um, they know what they did last year. They know what cases are kind of in the hopper or pending matters and so forth. And when everything is consolidated in one person, when you have turnover in that leadership it creates a lot of up, um, upheaval and the new person has a really steep learning curve. They also discussed this case, Morrison v. Olson, again, which is in um, the case books for both of these courses that I mentioned. And there the court approved for cause or removal protection, another basically, for an inferior officer, which in that case was the independent counsel, um, Alexis Morrison, uh, who had limited duties and she had no policymaking or investigative authority. So she's not creating regulations or bringing enforcement actions. She was appointed this independent counsel to basically investigate one scandal in, involving the um, president's EPA director um, and the, uh, some, uh, a scandal involving withholding uh, Superfund money for states uh, for environmental cleanups. And Morrison had narrow authority, therefore, to initiate criminal investigations and prosecutions of government officials. And in fact, in order for her to investigate someone, they had to be picked uh, as targets by someone besides her. Um, and in contrast, the majority says the CFPB director is a principal officer. So Morrison v. Olson's an inferior officer. And here we have a principal officer who promulgates um, uh, rules binding rules under 19 different uh, consumer protection statutes. So this covers everything from credit cards to car payments to mortgages to student loans. And the director also can bring enforcement actions and impose really huge penalties through administrative adjudications and civil court actions. Um, and I have a quote here from the opinion. Uh, that I pulled out for those of you who like to highlight in your casebook. In addition to being a historical anomaly, the CFPB's single director configuration is incompatible with our constitutional structure. Aside from the sole exception of the presidency, that structure scrupulously avoids concentrating power in the hands of any single individual. And then he goes on to give several examples of checks and balances that are built into the Constitution. We also have this issue of severability that you should be aware of. A lot of the opinion discusses this. Um, when courts find a constitutional defect in a statute, they often try to limit their solution uh, to the problem, severing the problematic portions and leaving the remainder of the statute intact. In, in, in other words, instead of overturning the entire statute, which means that an agency will cease to exist and all the regulations and all the pending actions. And then it would bring up a lot of questions about um, those past enforcement actions that had already been paid on and so forth. The, the court will try to keep as much intact as possible and just sort of carve out or sever the um, whatever phrase or clause is unconstitutional. Um, a statute that is bad in part is not necessarily void in its entirety, the court says, as long as the rest is can be separated uh, conceivably. Some statutes contain a um, severability clause built in that basically directs courts, if any part of this is unconstitutional, the rest of the statute is intended to survive. But even without that, traditionally, 
a court would sever the unconstitutional provision and keep the rest unless the remaining statute by itself is something that Congress would not have enacted. So it's possible that if we have to carve something out that it's so fundamental or such a core part of the statute that the rest of the statute makes no sense, right? And so we just really do um, need to invalidate the whole statute, but that's not the case here. Um, on the other hand, this was a point on which some of the majority dissented. And so that's why for this part of the opinion, we have only a plurality um, a, a opinion. A couple of the justices who were in the majority for the rest, for the point of saying that this is unconstitutional, wanted to invalidate the entire statute. Now we have a strident dissent from Justice Kagan, joined by some of the other uh, lefty judges on justices on the court. She argues that the exclusive removal power of the president is actually a historical fiction. And so she says, first of all, the text of the constitution is unclear about it. And she really um, develops this point at length that if you look at the constitution, it doesn't spell out expressly that only the president can remove people and Congress isn't allowed to impose any conditions on that. And um, then she goes into the Federalist Papers and said, okay, so the majority is talking about what con the first Congress intended. So let's look at the Federalist Papers. And the fact is, if you read the Federalist Papers and she goes through, lays out a kind of a nice um, montage of quotes, they're contradictory. The, the authors of the Federalist Papers contradict each other and even themselves, they change their mind uh, repeatedly about whether the president should have unfettered removal power of agency directors. The majority kind of has to explain this away saying, well, their thinking evolved or something like that. But the fact is we can find quotes from the founding fathers, plenty of quotes suggesting that the, they didn't intend the president to have an exclusive removal power. And then the, the early congressional practice was mixed on this point. So the majority has some examples that they cite, but she also gives it some examples, some pretty well-known historical examples. Um, where the president didn't have full removal power over people who were carrying out administrative tasks in the federal government uh, for, uh, at some times. And some of these were upheld in court decisions. So uh, the fact is, at least Justice Kagan and some of the other justices think that the um, majority is overstating the historical argument on their side. And that concludes our lecture about SALA law versus the CFPB.